Um, so uh, welcome. Thanks for coming. Um, my name is Barry Kimball. I'm a technical consultant for Autodesk. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, Class A modeling. I'm going to try to get a little bit in depth in some areas, but um, somewhat of an overview. We only have an hour, so you know we can't really get as deep into some of the stuff as I would like. And if you have questions while we're while we're moving along, you know, ask them and stop me right away because it's you know it'll make it more interactive for us. So we'll just skip through, but this is just supposed to um, basically expose everyone to some Class A. Um, concepts, I guess, and, and I'd like to, um, really what I'd like to do is kind of cl clear up, at least from my perspective, what is Class A surfacing? Because it's a term that lots of people use, lots of people are Class A surfacers. Well, maybe that's, many people think they're Class A surfacers. Not everyone is a Class A surfacer, and not everyone has to be, okay? So it's a specific job that is, uh, should only really be used at a certain stage in a product's development. You don't want to use Class A surfacing techniques throughout an entire development process, whether you're making phones, stereos, or cars, right? It's, it's only at a certain stage. So I'm hoping at the end of the class, you can understand, at least from my perspective, what Class A modeling is, um, understand some aesthetic and functional requirements, how alias can be used to bring, you know, from a, a earlier stage in design to the end. And I'll, I'll hopefully I can give you some tips and tricks. Um, if you're a, a alias user, you can go back to your jobs and use them. Um, term class A is uh, often used to describe <clears throat> levels of surface quality or techniques used to produce objects. All kinds of companies, um, have their own definitions of what Class A surfacing is, the tolerances that they need to work to, um, how, what level of quality is acceptable. So there isn't one set of rules for Class A surfacing. It varies by job, it varies by company, so on and so forth. So in, in my opinion, um, a Class A modeler, what, what you're really supposed to do is like protect the original design. It's not your design. As a Class A modeler, typically, you're not a designer. I find that um, really the job for a designer, they, they're a creative person. And Class A surfacing isn't really a creative task, right? It's a technical task. What you're trying to do is bring that design that someone else has done to production so that you don't lose that design that, they, that they've made, right? Now, you may have to work with the designer, and actually, not yeah, may have to. You'll always have to work with the designer to get, you know, the changes in that have to be put in based on engineering requirements, but you don't want to change it, right? You want to keep the original design. That's your job as the Class A surface person. You're the last, let's say, line of defense between the engineers and the designer, right? You need to be the protector of the design, okay? Um, I put a couple things in here, and <laughs> there's no glory in Class A modeling. There really isn't. You don't, your name doesn't get put in the paper. You don't go to the auto show and stand in front of the car. That's the designer, right? You're the, you're the mechanic, I guess. What you can get is overtime for doing a good job because they'll give you more work. You can make money, and then actually, yeah, you get more and more work, right? So Class A modelers um, typically are very detail-oriented people, right? They pay close attention to minute details. If something is supposed to be offset a half millimeter, you don't have it go from 0.45 millimeters to 0.52 needs to be 0.5. Really, the way I work, there isn't a tolerance to that. Maybe 0.505, but you're trying to keep things um, as close as possible, right? Most Class A people are very good at visualizing in three dimensions. So they can understand, here's a design, here's all my criteria. How can I best manage this criteria? And you know, a lot of times an engineer will say, hey, I need it to be exactly like this. So you need to challenge these people and say, well, really? I mean, if you, if you don't understand the criteria fully, I, I think you, you need to you know, look at the criteria again until you understand the criteria almost better than the engineer. Right? You need to almost teach him, OK, I know you need this much draft, but in this little area, could we just violate that a little bit? Right? You need to be that negotiator. So class A requirements and definition. So typically, um, 
you've seen a bunch of these images before. Use the simplest geometry. Be sure you've got your construction tolerances. Um, use Bezier versus NURBS, right? These are your typical uh, class A, I guess, concepts or things that people would say, hey, this is what a class A surface person, these are the things you have to know. But in my view, <clears throat> you have this area of work right here. On this side, let's say we had a part that you're just starting. It's not finished at all. God, I'm not nervous, but I can't keep that thing still. Um, you, you start a part right here, right? About 30% of the work, again, these are my opinions, is making big, nice, beautiful surfaces, right? That's, that's what everybody wants to do, I think, when, when they want to be a Class A modeler. I want to make the big body panels of the car. That's only a tiny portion of the work. The real work comes in these areas, where you're trying to make this joint between, between these two panels. Keep that, keep that joint perfect, right? A perfect radii on each side. Right, draft is all, all included. All of the, you know, the class A work is building this flange right here. That's where I would say 70% of the work is, right? And on, in interiors, it, it's magnified because you have so many parts in the fit and finish that, that puts those parts together. So I, I, I just wanna have the, you know, put it out there, the real work of a class A modeler is getting down in this trench and doing all this stuff, right? That's where the real work is. Not a lot of people are required to do this work. To me, um, I can teach people pretty quickly. Well, not, that's not fair to say. I think it's actually easier to make these big body panels. This is the much tougher work, right? This is what separates, uh, I don't want to say the men from the boys, but that, that's what really um, makes you a good Class A modeler if you can do that kind of work. So I've been um, probably Class A modeling for 25 years, um, <clears throat> and I haven't really seen any any good material for Class A work, right? There's, it's hard to find training. You can go out and, and see finding it, but most of what you get are making those big body panels, right? That's where most of the training um, is focused. How to get G3 continuity, and which we could discuss that at a later time, but G2, G3, G100, it doesn't matter. Is it smooth? If it's smooth and it looks good, that's what you want, right? So I feel that, our, and I have felt, that there's a lack of training new people, right? And, be, doing it 25 years, I'm starting to think, hey, um, I, I don't have that many more years you know, really left, and I don't see young people coming into the field. And I think that's because there's a not adequate training. So Autodesk, I, um, I work in the consulting group, and we had an opportunity to start developing Class A material. So myself and uh, uh, Carrie Kingston, I think if you guys were here yesterday, um, James Cronin presented the 10 golden rules. This is some material that, that you know, is probably, some of it came from carry stuff. She developed the, the, these fundamental rules and things, and that stuff over here is, is on this side, right? So this would be building on that current um, set of materials that are out there that I think are really good. But we got together, Uva Rossbacher and myself and Carrie got together and laid out a plan for a four-day class on what we thought a Class A surfacing person would need to know, okay? So first, primary surfaces, right? We would have a day full of primary surfaces. This is a prototype of the website, so you can't get to it yet. Um, hopefully we have it finished by March with the new release of the software, because all of the what's new, this will be basically a what's new document for any of the technical surfacing things that'll be in the next version of the package. They'll already be incorporated into this training. So what we'll have is every one of the green spots is a video that I've made. So these videos aren't like f two minutes long or three minutes long. Many of these videos are 20 minutes long, right? So you can watch, I'm, I'm modeling over scan data. And what I'm gonna show is each of these, I'm, I took kind of a snippet of, of, of one of each of these sections and I'm gonna go through each of these sections for us today. I think I'm running behind too. No, we're good. So primary surfaces. This is a, a car that we, um, we, we worked with, so in prototyping this uh, training, I've, I've done two training sessions with people. Um, we bring in, you know, some selected people and just, just to see if the training is working, right? So this is a car, it's a concept model that a designer named Wen Fu, he's from London, he made this concept model. And it's not class A, but it's a really good looking concept model. So what we want to do is to say, hey, Wen Fu, if we bring you in and teach you like four days worth of this training, what would you do differently when you modeled this car? What's the difference between your concept modeling skill set and if we teach you what it would be, what it would look like if you class A modeled this, what would you change? Okay, so I'm gonna just 
kind of jump over here to and just show you some of the stuff that we uh, came up with. Sorry about that. So this is some scan data from the front fender of that car we were just looking at, right? So a Class A surface person, the biggest challenge, I think, for new people is to get the surface structure right. That's the most critical. Surface structure first. Not number of CVs, not even CV placement. First step, if someone gives you something like this, whatever the form is, where am I going to put surfaces on this to approximate this shape? If you don't choose wisely, you'll be doing it over again. So when Fu, when he first gave, when he, when he, when he came in, this is the surface layout that he had. So when I look at this, I immediately notice one thing. My eye immediately goes, as a technical surfacing person, that there's something wrong right here. Something, this patch can't be oriented like that. There's going to be some strange continuity things to try to achieve there. You know, in, in asking him, you know, well, why did you lay this out radially and you laid this out in a different way? And he said, well, I like this section. So I just railed that section back, and then I knew it had to vanish. This is how he chose to do it. So the, really, the preferred method here would, would really be to have those surfaces laid out like this. So let me turn the scan data off here really quick. And the difference isn't, isn't very big, right? But in, in, in continuity-wise, though, if, we, if I turn this on and we get a little transparency here so we can see both highlights, if you, if you look at the highlights right here, do you notice how this one highlight really hooks down at the end, right? And then the one that's below it, that's the revised version, it smoothly transitions, right? That was an unintended consequence of him laying out his patches incorrectly. He, he didn't notice it, and it was a concept model, but immediately when I look at this and then I turn the control vertices on, I can see that, yeah, that's, that's not good. And then when you, when you show him some techniques, and really a lot of it is simply visualization, when you, when you look at these surfaces, right, this guy, I mean, immediately I can see that surface has some issues, right? You can't have those control vertices zigzagging. If they're zigzagging, even at a minute level, if these three surfaces in the middle where my cursor is, if those three CVs are negative, that means that surface has a hollow spot in it. It's, it's just how surfaces work. So we don't want a low spot or a hollow spot in that surface. So that, those CVs need to be bumped up a little bit, right? Now, the, how they got there is when he started to try to achieve continuity at that weird, thin, um, acute angle at the bottom corner, you can see how the software, and it's not really the software, surfaces don't like to behave that way. You can't have them have acute or really obtuse angles at their boundaries. You want to try to keep things as rectangular as possible with 90 degree corners. Now, you can't always do that, right? But if you start with that idea as a foundation, then you can have some um, tighter angles at your corners, but not angles like this. Okay, so. And the difference here is, if we look at some of these control vertices, okay, now we have those control vertices smoothed out in this surface, right? It's, I could do some diagnostics. We're only about a half a millimeter away on this surface, so that's the fine detail that we're talking about, right? Moving that CV and balancing those out, really the deviation between the two surfaces is very small. But the, the, real, the real key is to get this surface right here to behave how you want it to behave, right? So now we get nice CV structures on all of these surfaces and, and everything is happy, okay? So that's some, just some surface layout, I guess, ideas that you should, um, you should keep in mind. Oops. Okay, no questions, good. So next is um, secondary surfaces. So I would say that this is a primary surface, right? This is a primary surface. This is a primary surface. These are actually secondary surfaces, right? They come second after the originals. So once you lay these out, a lot of people, when you just look at this scan, right? If we just had to lay out surfaces for this scan right here, where do I start? So I'm gonna pull this up and, and just show you how I would, and it's really, um, it comes with experience and it's kind of a, I don't wanna say it's a guessing game, but you have to make an educated guess at where you're gonna lay these surfaces out. So you can use things like curvature maps, right? So if I turn on a curvature map here, and I'm just gonna dial up this curvature a little bit, right? This shows us um, 
positive and negative curvature, right? So when I'm looking at this right here, I'm noticing that, you know, this area seems like it's kind of got even curvature, right? This seems like even curvature. This seems like kind of a drag section, but I can see that this has got an S shape right here, right? This is negative, this is positive. This is negative, this is positive. Negative and positive, right? So now I can get, make an educated guess at where my patch lines are gonna be. So Alias does have some sketching tools, and I've, I've started to use them more. Um, really, it was, it was during some tr uh, developing the training. But if we just shade this up and look at it, right, I think this is where you have to um, understand patch layout. How, how, do I, how am I going to take this line and vanish it to nothing? How do I do that? Well, you, you need to plan that out originally. But first, I would, I would do what you can do and then move to what uh, the, what will be a little harder. So if we just take kind of a, uh, a marker here, and I, I, don't have a I don't have my Cintiq hook up, so excuse my sketching. Oh, but I can draw on this laptop screen. So I know that there's a line there. That's not a good line. I know that there's a line here. I know that there's a line here, right? I said that this area right here, that was going to have to be a patch. That's kind of even curvature, right? I said that we looking at that curvature plot that this looks like a surface. Then this across the top here. And, I, and it, I draw these like this, too, before I start. Right? I always have a concept of what I'm going to try to do, and then I stick with that until it doesn't work. Okay? So I'm going to have one surface that runs across the top. Then I know this is a fixed line. right? I need to build to that line. Then this is a transition. So I'm going to build that transition, right? This guy here. Then I know that this is a transition area. So I need to build a surface here. Well, it just naturally flows, right? That a line going across here, and I'm going to need a surface right there. Okay? This area right here and this area right here, I'm not quite sure yet how I'm going to blend those out. But I'll, I'll do that when I get to it. First, I need to be sure that this structure works. Okay? So if we just get to that point, so I'm not going to sit here and build all these surfaces. We don't have the time. But these are just simple kind of patches. Their order is a little bit high. Just because I'm working at 0 0.001 millimeters, so the order is a little, the degree is a little bit higher than I would typically use. But this is our layout of patches. Right, so I haven't blended this together yet. And if you look, these are flowing nicely. Right? So how do I get to that next step? Well, what I would say is, I'm gonna, I, I know that a curve needs to be built that kind of bridges between this edge and this edge, right? Those should probably connect. So I'm going to put that, put that line in there like that. And I need to be sure that that line on each end, these are blend curves, so um, they're, they're, they're fairly easy to use. I, I just want to get that line continuous, and I want to get this continuous, right? And then I'm going to project that on. So I'm just going to go over here and say uh, surface, create curve, project. And I don't want to bog down with how you project curves and things. I'm hoping people understand that stuff. But I'm just going to project it in this view. Okay, So that's going to be my end line for that peak right there. Well, where should it end at? Well, I'm just going to say I think it's going to end somewhere around here. This wants to be nice and smooth all through here. So I'm just going to draw a couple of curves in here. So I'm going to make an edit point curve. Just use degree one. And I'm going to come back to this view, and I'm going to say, hey, let's, um, let's go from maybe here to there, and maybe here to there. Right? Now, this is a guess. I don't know yet. And then I need to project those on. So we'll grab the surface, project these guys on. Now I'm starting to get a little bit of a layout here. And I'll just stash these over here for a second. Oops. OK, now I'm starting to get a little bit of a layout where I could put a surface. All right, because I have one, two, three, four boundaries. All right, so I'm just going to do a little bit of trimming here. So I'll just uh, get my curve thing here, I'm going to segment that, and I want to trim this, yep, go ahead, to this and this. And we can get rid of this center piece. 
There's my four-sided four surface right there. Then I'm just going to use a square. Square or by rail? Mm. Square's intent is to blend four edges together. Each curve has equal influence over the middle. By rail is to take a section and rail it along another curve, right? Maintaining that section shape. So by rail and square have two different reasons for, their, for, for existing. In this case, I want to blend between all four edges. So I'm going to use a square. I've got two COSs for some reason. And we'll go to this edge. Okay. Now, we don't need any, any continuity at this point. So right now, I've got a patch sitting right there. Patch or surface. Um, I'm not going to have explicit control on right now, just to show what explicit control can do. Um, I'll ask for continuity on this edge, and I'll ask for continuity on this edge. By this edge, I mean here and here. Okay? Now, that surface has a ton of CVs. I don't really think it needs that many control vertices. What it's doing is it's picking up its, its degree from the surfaces that it's built to, and since this surface is of a higher degree, it's just taking that. But you can use your explicit control right here and ask for degree 5. Right? So pick nothing, and I'll just do a quick trim here. Turn this on, and we get a nice flow right there. Right? And if we turn off all of our, um, our model, you can see that now we have this line comes along, and all of a sudden, it's gone. Right? All in the surface layout. Let me check the time here. OK. All right. I won't build this next one. It's built the same way, and I'm not going to finish blending it. But now you have that nice vanishing line right there. You have history, so you could still make some modification to this. And if we look back at the STL file, and we, we can um, diagnose the differences here, but we, um, you get nice curvature plot. Now, curvature plot, anyone know why that's not working correctly? Surface normal. OK. I'm just being sure everybody's watching. So we'll get all these guys changed around. And there. All right. OK. So all in the details. Right? So first we did primary surfaces, right? and then we did some secondary surfaces, those transitions. And now this is where, I guess, the real, the real stuff is. <clears throat> Let's just say this was a corner of a part that someone was designing. I don't even remember what this was, but it's, it's a good, I think it's a good representation of what a Class A modeler does. And you don't do things just by chance. Everything you do should have a purpose. Right? This has a chamfer on it right here. That chamfer is a certain width, and it's maintained all the way across, and it's a certain depth below surface, right? And now we want to eliminate that chamfer as it goes around the surface, as it goes around the corner. Well, there's a lot of, there's a lot of I don't want to say flexibility, but there's a lot of chance for this as it goes around the corner to change angle, right? So we need to control that angle because this angle should be maintained relative to the surface. That chamfer should be end at this radius, right? Not end up at this point. It needs to end at this radius and be at this same angle. So how do we, how do we get this angle constructed over here? Well, again, class A surface person should look at that, analyze it, and develop a way to move that chamfer over around that corner. And it's not that easy. Well, actually, let me say it a different way. It's easy to do if you use the tools. So if we switch to that file here. OK, so nothing up my sleeve. We just have that file. So right now, we have an angle right here, right? And that angle, that angle is um, some angle. It doesn't, it doesn't really matter, but it just worked out to be that angle right there. So what I, what I need to do is transfer this angle to the other side. How can I do that? Well, I'm going to use construction planes. I use planes all the time. Okay? So I want to make a three-point plane, and this is important. I, I need to pick these points the same, because I'm going to use a tool that translates things from one plane to another plane. Okay? So I'm going to make my base point for my plane right here. I'm going to make my second point 
on that surface. And my third point, I'm going to put on the radius. Okay? Next plane. I'm going to come over to this side. I'm going to start here, then here, then on the radius. Right? Next. Now, I'm going to just duplicate a curve over here. So I'm just going to say curve, create, duplicate, and grab this guy. Okay? I'll pick that object and then go transform. Place is the tool that allows you to move from plane to plane. So I'm going to grab this plane. Yep, that's a good plane. Go from there. And then I'm going to grab this plane. Yep. And then place it. Now I have the angle. That angle is now the same angle on both sides, oriented to the surface the same way. Now I need to know, where does that hit this surface? Okay. Well, because I need to create that angle and then connect it to the other side. All right. So we'll use the parting line tool to develop that. So first thing I need is a vector. So I'm going to create a vector right here on that line. Now I know that angle. Now I need to know where the horizon line is of this, so the line of zero draft on that surface. So I'm just going to grab this surface here. Oops. Grab this guy here. Turn on my surface analysis. Okay. I don't need the negative, and I want to pick this vector, right? And if you look down here in this menu, you can say, update the angle from my selection, all right? So if we turn off positive draft, okay, There's my zero degree line. So that line right there, if we were looking up this line, just like that, again, using these, using these um, viewing tools, you have to be really good at using these viewing tools so you can get the right angles, right? So that now is where my chamfer needs to end. That's the tangent of where my, my chamfer is. So how can I get a surface now that comes from that line and, and makes that chamfer? Well, I'll use the draft tool. So surfaces, multi-surface draft, I'll pick this edge, I'll pick this vector, okay, and then say build. And it creates, basically now I have a surface that's constructed that's touching that surface right exactly where the chamfer angle is the same on both sides now. Now all I need to do is connect those two chamfers around the corner. All right. Everybody with me? <laughs> okay. Maybe, maybe not. Um, actually, I don't need double-sided, and I'm not, I'm not worried about the history um, updating right now. I'm just going to flip that and get this side. Okay. Now, I'm going to extend that a little bit. All right. Oops. I want to have merge on. All right, and we'll extend this a little bit. All right. We can turn our shading off. Now, there's a few ways to get a few ways to get this chamfer around the corner. Okay. One way is you could just say, "Hey, let's use surfaces, and I want to make a blend, a freeform blend, and I want to just blend from this angle to this angle." All right. And it puts me a surface in there. Okay. So now I've transferred that chamfer all the way around the corner. Pardon? <clears throat> Sorry. Um, what you need to pay attention to at this point, though, is this structure of surface, right, and where these CVs are, this surface should have its CVs in those same locations. Okay? So I would just do this manually, and I'm going to see if I can actually get this thing to build this with. Yeah, one is okay. I'll use some CV controls, right? <clears throat> and I'm going to use sliding. And I'm just going to take this, this row of CVs, and I want it to be at the same location as this row. So I'm just going to slide that back a little bit, right there. I want this one to be here. And I want this one to be there. And I want this one to be there. Could you build this? 
without making those subtle adjustments. Yes, you could. Then you wouldn't be doing Class A surfacing if you left them where they were. This is the detail that you have to do when you're making Class A surfaces. Every one of these CVs should be in a spot. It needs to match up with his friends, and then those two surfaces will work better together. If you have that slight distortion in those CVs, that makes the software has to do more mathematics to blend between those misoriented control vertices, right? It's a simple thing, it only takes a few seconds, and it's the difference between, I, I would say, regular modeling and making this class A modeling, okay? It's all these little tiny details. So, <clears throat> let me check for time here. Yep. So now that we have that, how do we get our fillets to build correctly, okay? Well, here we have a curve, it's a blend curve. Same principle. Those control vertices should sit on those control vertices. If you just simply snap a blend curve through here, and I'm not sure if this still has history. Oh, yep, it does. So if you just made a basic blend curve across there, maybe these control vertices would be like that, okay? Well, I can tell you that that curve is not on that surface. And the reason that that curve is not on and even close is because the control vertices are in different places. Maybe I should just build this really quick so I can show you guys what I mean. So I'm going to go from this edge here, right, and I want that to be continuous, and I'm going to build to this edge here and have that be continuous, okay? So there's a default blend curve, right, and that's where the control vertices pop out. Same principle. Well, let, let me just do this too. I, can, I think this might illustrate it a little better. If I measure the deviation right now from a curve to a surface, and I measure from this curve to this surface, we're off by a half a millimeter, okay? I could project that on, get a curve on surface, and build from it. It would let me do that. But that's not optimal. Optimal is if you just do these things by sight, so we were off a half a millimeter, which is, which is tiny, right? It's not that big. But I would slide these CVs until those CVs line up, slide the curvature until it lines up, and it's visual, right? I'm not measuring the distance, it's just visual. <laughs> then I'm gonna go over here, get this guy on, bring this guy back, okay? And now if we measure the evaluation between a curve to a surface, we're only off by 0.1 of a millimeter. So if you look, if, now if, if I was really doing this and we gun sighted this, if you look down this hole right here, you can probably see, see how that's off. If that was on and we made that little adjustment, we could get this curve to basically sit exactly on this surface without projecting it. And that just, it's just an optimization that you do to make the next thing that you do easier on the software, right? If you optimize every one of these. So my next step, I guess, to do this would be to um, simply project that curve onto a surface. I want to use normal. And then to get the, the bottom blend here, I would use surfaces. Not many people use this, I think, but it's a great tool, especially for this. Symmetric fillet. I don't know what radii I need, right? Let's say that, I, I mean, maybe I didn't even build this. Maybe someone else built it. But if I build to this tangent line right here, if I build to this tangent line, it will line up with this. So if we just simply say surfaces, multi-surface blend, symmetric, and I pick this as the edge, accept it, and then I'm gonna pick my chamfer here, and I'm just gonna make this circular, okay? We wanna build it this way, all right? Now those are the same shape right there. Why aren't they lined up? That's, that's just because this is edge aligned, right, and this one is not, okay? So that's not any, that's deviation we can't fix um, right here in the fillet, but what I wanted to show you is it constructs the radii to match, right, only from one tangent line. So basically it's der deriving the radius values from the tangent line that you're giving it, right? And then on the other side, we get the same, we get the same thing, okay? We do have a little, a little deviation because they're not in plane, but hey, a simple align would fix that, okay? So for the sake of time, I'm not really gonna, well, I could build the other side, but for the sake of time, I'm not really gonna build the other side. This would just be, you know, I would come in here and do an extend, grab this guy here, 
take this edge, extend this over, snap it to there, then do an alignment, right? And I can get that continuity there. That's pretty small stuff, but <clears throat> right, the principle is getting the chamfer built correctly around the corner, not just sweeping a curve with natural turned on in, in, in monorail, right? You're building that chamfer with a purpose, okay? All right, and no questions, good. So, next we have, um, I think the, the most difficult surface layout. Is it really a mystery how you come up with a surface layout? So, it, it, like I said before, it's one of the most important parts of developing surface data. First we do primary surfaces, right? And then, but the primary, this is the key. The primary surfaces need to be created first but already with your plan for blending them out. Don't make all your primaries with no concept of how you're gonna blend it, right? And it gets difficult when we have a shape like this, right? Who would like to surface this? Where do you put your first surface? <laughs> yeah, it's a good question. Maybe you can see right here there's kind of a shape, but this actually turns in, right? <coughs> Try to use a curvature plot. This is the scan that I got from the company. So can't use a curvature plot like we used on the previous one. Even if you turn on minimum radius check, right? This is, it's like cottage cheese is what this STL file is like. It's not a good, and you get what you get and don't throw a fit. So if this is what you have to start with, you're gonna have to get um, smart about how you lay out your patches, right? So I, again, just use drawing tools. Where am I gonna put the, where does it look to me like there are main areas, and I want to draw those theoreticals. Okay, so to me, those are theoretical intersections. This one's kind of for free, right? It's at the center line. Then I kind of think, hey, this is a radius. You know, I've, I'll, I'll pull this model up and we can rotate it around. But this is probably a little flat right here. This is a main surface running across the top. This is a transition. And then I connect all these lines, right? They all go somewhere and they all have a reason for going there. Right? This area looks like it's kind of flat, and then this has got a radius to it. So I need a theoretical to control that radius. And again, if you look at these, these aren't the curves that I'm going to use. I'm just drawing these in here. So don't, you're not worried about little waviness and things. This is a strategy for me to develop surfaces, okay? Then I draw my, fill, my fillet lines. So with every theoretical, there's a fillet, right? So now I draw those in. And that's my surfacing strategy for this part. And then you begin to develop the surfaces. That's a curvature plot of those surfaces afterwards. And if you look at the curvature plot of the surfaces, they directly, can I go backwards? Yeah. They directly follow where those fillet lines are, right? So if this is a radius that's positive, and then we look at the curvature plot, positive, right? And then in the end, you get a super smooth set of data, okay? So I'm just gonna pull this up and, and rotate it around a little bit just so, just so we can check it out. Where'd my model go? There we go. Okay, so again, so <clears throat> you can't even get good highlights on this thing, right? Because the scan is so poor, right? But you can see them a little bit. Um, if we turn on some mapping type, some rainbow mapping here maybe, you can get a little better idea of where some things are. But in, in the past, I think we're actually very fortunate. <clears throat> 25 years ago, you never got a scan that was a three-dimensional model that you could rotate and visualize. You got an egg crate, a bunch of cross sections, much more difficult to lay out those surfaces that way, right? You have to basically you know, imagine that all you have to work with is um, Oops. is just that. Good luck, right? How, how do you begin to know where to, if you had nothing to shade, and you know, we surfaced things before they came out with the new scanning technology, you know, maybe, I wanna say 20 years ago probably, or 15 is when it started to get popular, 
You know, now it's much easier to visualize this stuff. What does it look like? Well, it looks like that. So with this, you can kind of see how I laid out those, those patches, or patches, sorry, surfaces, same patches, same term. Um, right, I look at this and I say, hey, that negative right there, that's gonna have to have a theoretical, right? That's where I started drawing. And I, and I, and I do it just like I, I showed you guys before. Just start drawing and um, There's my theoretical. I see this line right here. Oh, that's going to need a theoretical. I see this fillet right here. That's going to need a theoretical, right? And you just start drawing those things in and come up with your patch strategy, OK? So a couple of things that I would do when I'm working on stuff like this, too. Get the things in first that I know have to be there. For instance, um, the gas cap, right? If I have the gas cap, put the gas cap in, offset from the gas cap, and you know where your top surface starts, right? There's no reason to, you know, I, I brought this in. Obviously, it was scanned, but I brought it in and, and made it and put it in there, rotated it until it was, you know, perfect. It's symmetrical, blah, blah, blah. Then I just offset that ring. I know I wanted to have it under flush, so I offset that down, right? Obviously, when they made this, and here's, here's another tool that I use quite often, is the, we'll call it squishy view. Um, I know that when this clay model was developed, they didn't want that ring to have all those lumps and bumps in it, right? That wants to be a planar sheet. So put the stuff in that you know is the foundation and then work from there, okay? Um, around here, the frame, I don't think I have the frame in here, but and we get back out of squishy view here. All right, this, this must made up with something. It's a motorcycle, right? It's got a seat. Do I build the seat first or the tank first? Uh, you build them at the same time. You, you have to establish this brake line between both parts. May as well bring the seat scan in and build that sheet first, right? This edge right here, this edge was an offset of the frame. So no matter where this scan is, I know I have to be a certain offset from the frame. So I offset that frame and then work to that edge. You know, people can accept if they have to deviate. You know, the clay model is developed, it's free form. It's, they, they try to put things in that are perfect offsets and things, but they, they can't do it perfectly. And it's not a requirement for them when they're building a, a clay model to make it perfect, in my opinion. That's, that's a surfacing task later. Don't spend time on doing these, these little details in a clay when I've got to surface it anyways, right? And I can put these offsets perfectly. Okay. <clears throat> So this was the theoretical surface set for this, this model, all right? So if we just shade that and you do it like that, right? You can see how those are. So as this radius vanishes, right, these surfaces, and if you notice my viewing, right, I, I like to, the way I use this screen is like if I'm sitting here and I've got this tank, how do I want to look at it? Well, I, I wouldn't turn my head sideways to look at the gun sight, the tank, right? I would turn the tank up on its side and look at it, right? So I use the software the same way. It's my workbench. So when I'm doing a headliner, if I was modeling a headliner, you, you never see the people model a headliner. Like, the clay modelers aren't scraping above their head, right? They flip it over and they lay it down on a table and they work on it, just like you would. So when I'm working on a headliner, it's upside down, right? I, it's a key visualization. And by visualization, I don't mean shading and things like that. I mean the way you look at the model. That's a really important part of Class A surfacing. I, I use the tools, um, I think it's called azimuth and elevation. Yeah. So azimuth and elevation allow me to twist this on the screen with the right mouse button, okay? And I can fully tumble. So I like that twist with the right mouse button because I can then orient things so that I can look at them, right? and get an idea. If I, right, I, would, I can much e more easily see if that's a good edge than if it's laying down on its side, I believe, like that. Right? I can get reference to other things, you know, like the bottom of the screen to see if stuff is flat. I don't know. If we look at these CV structures, they're probably pretty, pretty decent. Yeah. Right? And then from, from that, you put the blends in. So most of the I heard some, you know, yesterday I was in, in um, one of the classes and there was a lot of discussion about uh, the fillets and if you use, you know, do you use the fillets that come out of the surface fillet tool? Yes. I mean, if, if, you, if in the past you, you haven't had good results using the fillet function, I, I would suggest revisiting it. A lot of work goes in every year on developing 
uh, better fitting for the, for the surface uh, fillet tool, you know, more control over the levels of continuity. You know, previously we didn't have um, center radius control, right? We didn't have that in previous versions. There's a lot of functionality now that's been put into this. Um, and when you're, when you're in curvature mode, now we get um, form factor that you can use. So that form factor works with all the other tools. So if you use the same form factor in, in surface fillet and you bring that form factor and you use it in freeform blend, you'll get the same lead in on both surfaces, right? They're made now to work in unison. The form factors are equal. Okay, so if you, if you haven't had luck with the surface fillet tool, I, I would suggest revisiting it because, I mean, I build surface data all the time in, in, in a production environment and I always use the surface fillets. I don't use them for the tangents and then rebuild. It's, it's unnecessary to me. Okay. Yes. Exactly. That's a good point, Don. So a lot of times the fillets, and I, th I think I might have had that in one of the slides, you can use the fillets to determine if your slabs were good, right? If you build, if you build a fillet and it, it bunches up in an area, right, that's an indication that, wow, there's something kind of crazy going on with the orientation of your two slabs, right? Um, and yeah, and it's a typical workflow. And actually, we, we cover that somewhat in um, our blending function. So we spend a whole day in that class A um, training thing doing blending, right from a simple ball corner. If you can make a simple ball corner that's curvature on all sides and is bezier, you, you, really there isn't much you can't blend. Okay, because a lot of people I see have a lot of trouble with just doing a ball corner, right, and getting it to be a nice pure surface. But there's a few techniques that, that um, you can use to help with that. But that's where a training material will be for. So, okay, so. I think that's about it. So session feedback, I'd, I'd appreciate if you guys um, filled out some feedback at the survey stations so I can you know, know if it was good or maybe we can make some changes to next, to next year's presentation if we're back here. Um, and yeah, that's all I had. So thanks everyone for coming. If you don't have any questions. <laughs>